following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Hebraic Satanic Myth 3 The Ten Plagues The Ten Plagues in Egypt I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the selection and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the hiddenmost parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him, unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the nations, <coughs> to whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the hindmost parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword, this is Pharaoh and all his multitude, said Jah Jehovah Adonai. This is the verse of Ezekiel, chapter 31st, 16 to 18. We must distinguish between Satan and Lucifer. Satan is a devil black like carbon. The falling Lucifer. We must whitewash the devil. This is only possible by practicing sexual magic intensely and by disintegrating the ego. Humanity has Lucifer converted into the devil. Each one of us must by whitewash his particular devil in order to convert him into Lucifer. When Lucifer shines within ourselves, he converts himself into our particular individual, Moses. Fortunate is the one who integrates himself with his own Moses. Moses, descending from Sinai with the luminous horns upon his forehead, deserved to be chiseled by Michelangelo. The doctrine of Moses is the doctrine of Lucifer. So, when we talk about the Pharaoh and Moses, we had to comprehend that the word Pharaoh begins with Pe of the Hebrew letters, which symbolizes the power of the word that was in the beginning. 
And then the, you find the other syllable, ra, in the Hebrew letters, fe ra. The word ra, which we you find in the book of Genesis when qualifying good and evil. The letter resh and the letter ajin, ra. And at the end of the word Pharaoh, you find the letter He. This is why you find Pharaoh. The letter He of the word Yod He Vav He, the sacred name of God. So the word Pharaoh in the Bible describes, of course, the activity of the world through evil in the, the world of Malkut, which is the final He of the Holy Name. Yod, He, Vav, He, which is translated as Jehovah. And we call it Yod Chava. So, the ten plagues that we find in the book of Exodus that Moses unleashed against the Pharaoh according uh, with the commands of God. You read there, very clear, in the book of Exodus that Jod He Vav He Jehovah uh, sent Moses in order to liberate Israel from bondage. And of course, the one that has Israel under bondage is a Pharaoh. And uh, it is written that God, when talking to Moses, he said to Moses, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, thus he will not let them go. He repeats this time and time again. It is very clear there that Moses wants to liberate the people in Egypt. And he's doing these wonders in front of the Pharaoh. But God is working inside the Pharaoh, hardening the heart, and saying, I will, I will let the, their people go. So you see here, very clear, that the one that is behind the Pharaoh, not allowing Moses to take the people of Israel, is the same Jehovah. And the same Pharaoh, of course, is Satan, in other words. He's on shadow. Because he is the king of Mizraim, which the Bible, a translator, transcribes as Egypt. Mizrahim. Who is the king of Mizrahim? The Pharaoh. Which in this case, of course, is Satan. That has all the forces of Israel enslaved. But let us explain. According to the tree of life. How this happened. Because we have to understand who is yod he vav he Jehovah, and who is Satan? In the previous lecture, we explained about Christus Lucifer. And Lucifer, of course, is the shining aspect of Satan when he's not fallen. But Satan is, as the Matthew Samael explains, the fallen Lucifer. Is that energy? 
trapped into the matter. When we study the tree of life and the four worlds of the tree of life, we find the four worlds. The world of Atziluth, which is the world of splendors, archetypes, which relate to the first triangle of the tree of life, Keter, Chokmah, Bina, which in Christianity is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that in previous lectures, we explained that uh, these three primary forces are uh, symbolized uh, with the Hebrew letters of the holy name of God, with Keter, the letter Yod, Chokmah, the letter He, and Bina, the letter Vav. So Yod, He, Vav are the three in Hebrew. We explained uh, that in Latin, these three primary forces read in Latin words, E, A, O, because in Hebrew there is no vowels. They were invented after with dots and lines. So when we uh, read uh, Yod, He, Vav, by itself, by one, like a one word, what do we read? We read this word. Yew. Jew, in other words. Which is a singular for Yuri or Jews. So it is very remarkable how the Bible uh, hides that. So in other words, the three primary forces, Keter, Homa, Bina, in relation with the holy name of God, yod he vav is Eeu, you. So, that means that this sacred word, you, implies the word of Atziluth, the word of light. When we read the Pisti Sophia, written by uh, the apostles and dictated by Master Jesus, he says there, And Jesus pronounced the holy sacred name, Yehu, Jew, and said unto his disciples, Now you are clairvoyant. Because that light, of course, makes you see the mysteries. So, <coughs> when the Gnostic wants to seal himself with a star of five points, he just opens his legs and form with the standard arms the five-pointed star. And then begins by making a triangle by touching their finger of their hands above their head, forming, of course, the mysterious world of Atziluth, represented in the triangle of Keter Chokmah Bina. Yehu. This Yehu, or the three primary forces, descends from the world of Ains of Or. So we will say that the light Or in Hebrew has two extremes that are united by the mysterious letter Vav, which is just one line. One stream is in the unknowable divine, which is the Ains of Or, which is the primordial light, the first manifestation of the light of the 
absolute, abstract space. And the other end of that line is precisely called Keter. which is the manifested light in the universe. <coughs> That's why Keter means crown. And it's represented as an aura of light upon the head. It's just energy. From it emerges Chokhmah, which is wisdom, which is the first manifestation of that light. That's why Chokhmah is called the sun. Chokhmah Reshit in Hebrew. The beginning. And after that, Bina, which is intelligence. So when we are pre uh, performing that star of, or that pointed star with our hands, touching our fingers of our hands above the head, we are doing that triangle. We are imagining that the light of the Ains of Or, of the unknowable divine, descends upon our head totally, uh -huh. beginning with the crown. And this is how it happened in the beginning of creation, how that light descended into the first triangle, and it's just why that triangle is called Arik Ampin which is a Chaldean word, which means the huge head or the huge face. Of course, if you imagine your head in the middle of that triangle, that's the huge head represented. Sadikampin. But of course, that light in that triangle called Atziluth, which from the archetypes has ten divine names that I will enumerate them just uh, briefly in, you, in order for you to remember the ten names or ten parts of that divine light which has no stain, just pure light. The first, in relation with the tree of life, is called Eheye, Asher Eheye. Then, in Chokhmah, you find yod he bav he which is translated as Jehovah. In Binah, you find Jehovah Elohim. Then, in Hesed, you form El, which means God. In Geburah, Elohim Gibor. In Tifereth, Eloah Va Da'at Yod He Vav He. Then in Netzah, you find Yod Chaba Sabaoth. And here in Hod, Elohim Sabaoth. Then in Yesod, El Shaddai, the Almighty God. And the last one in Malkut, Adonai. Those are the holy names or the archetypes in the world of Atsiluth that we have to self-realize in each one of us. We have to develop that. That is the goal. When we reach that, we are like Elohim, beyond good and evil. But to do that is precisely the big task. It's not easy. Let us continue with the start of five points. After we reach and make the triangle with our head in the middle of that triangle, we descend our hands in our shoulders. On our shoulders. And extend them to the right and to the left. That is forming the duality from the trinity. In other words, descending the light 
from the world of Atziluth into the world of Bria, which is the world of creation. Because these three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in order to create, needs to be divided in two polarities, two forces that we explain in many lectures that are represented by the extended arms from the shoulders to the streams, left and right. Those two forces is what we call Ava and Ima, father and mother, which are, of course, united in the mysterious Sephirah, that, which is a mysterious Sephirah that, that encloses creation, the mystery of creation. So when we talk about father and mother, honor father and mother, we have to understand that that father and mother is the vesture of the Holy Trinity. They hide behind them the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Because each one of them is the outcome of the Holy Trinity. As we explain in other lectures, if we imagine ourselves in our three brains, the intellectual brain, the emotional brain, and the sexual, instinctual motor brain in one body, then we understand why God is three in one. Or as others say, the water as steam is the father. The water as fluid is the sun, and the water as solid, ice, is the Holy Spirit. The same force in three aspects. From them, of course, emerges the duality that we call sun and moon. The light of the moon within the Holy Trinity has its own light. But when it descends from the Holy Trinity, the light of the moon depends on the light of the sun. In other words, the mother emerges from the father. Eve emerges from Adam. And here is where the problem begins, according to the myth. Because you know that in that knowledge, we find the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, of course, in the world of creation is when we find the first manifestation of that that we call Ra. Which is, of course, a klipha in Hebrew, which is mean a shell. A shell that appears for the first time, which is certain mechanicity that hides the light. So that light that is pure in the first world of Azilut becomes a little bit of a little bit mechanical within the world of Bria. That mechanicity is called shell, cliffa. But a positive, not negative, because the plural for cliffa is clipoth. But we have to understand this in order to comprehend, because when you read the Bible, you find that the tree of good and evil had good and evil. So good is that pure light. And evil is the same light, but with a shell. In other words, in a simple example, we will say, if you compare this light and this evil with a fruit, with the fruit of the tree of good and evil, then you will understand that the juice of the fruit is inside. And the seed that gives life of that fruit is inside. But the shell that covers that fruit is outside. And this is precisely the mystery of the tree of good and evil. 
the two forces are in the, in the fruit. As you can see, the seed is always the power of the Holy Spirit, which is inside, to learn how to eat that fruit. It's precisely the mystery of that. When you read in the Bible that God said to Adam and Eve, you shall not eat from that fruit. You have to understand that the commandment is, you shall not eat of that fruit like an animal. Does it? You know, when a human being takes an orange, usually they take the peel out of it first and then eat the fruit. But if you see an animal eating fruit, it doesn't peel anything. Especially if it's a pig. It's all of it, all of it. Right? But we had to learn how to select what is not klipoth, what is not klipha. Hmm? It's always represented that fruit with an apple, of course. When Eve took the fruit, he bite it with shell and everything. That's the meaning of eating as a beast. While the way of eating as, as an Elohim, as a, as a God, as a human being, is by knowing how to select the fruit and how to make it, as in Hebrew it said, kosher. The word kosher means sacred, holy, consecrated. All fruits are like that. This is what is called in Kabbalah, klifa noga. A fruit which is, which is shiny. Because when we see the fruit which is shiny to the eyes and good to eat, what are we seeing? We are seeing the light of Atziluth within it, within the seed. Because from it comes all the beauty of the life of the fruit. And this is precisely what Eve saw when he saw the fruit. Symbolically speaking, of course. But of course, when she ate it, she ate it like the beasts. And uh, lost the light in it. When you know how to eat it as kosher, sacred, in Kabbalah, it means that you eat it with God. That means to eat it with kosher, with sacred. When you eat it with God, not with you. Remember that you are an animal, but God is inside. So that's why in Sanskrit, there is a, a mantra that you pronounce when you eat, is K-R-I-M, cream. In order to take the Shakti potential of the fruit. I mean, what is that Shakti potential of the fruit? That is the Divine Mother. The feminine force hidden within the fruit. The Divine Mother Shakti. And then you feed with that Shakti potential your spirit, your own God. You are not eating just physically, but spiritually. And that's why the Bible talks about what is the holy food in order to eat and what is not holy. And it is because in nature you find elements that are devolving and evolving. The evolving elements are good for the soul. You, when you eat them, you pronounce cream. Obviously, you obtain the Shakti potential. But if you eat an element that is not holy, that is, means that is devolving or degenerated, adulterated, you cannot obtain anything from it. It's already clipot, impure. But the word klifa noga means noga is the world of the astral world, the, the hod, the light, hidden 
within any physical element. In ourselves, that Noga or Hod, Shakti potential, is hidden in the seed, in the sexual seed. Because we are like a fruit. But where do we find the juice of our fruit? All that seed, that juice, is in the sexual organ. That's why we associate that fruit with a sexual act. And that's why when you are with your standing arms to the right and the left, to the right and the left, making the five point the star, you descend your arms towards your sex and cross them. The right le uh, arm over the left of your sex. That means, very clear, that in order to take advantage of that mother and father, the tree of good and evil, you have to cross, you have to eat the fruit through your sex by crossing sexually. is the only way. Hmm? This creation. It's very clear, pointed, when you are performing that mysterious seal called the pentagram. So there, of course, you know that you have to cross yourself, sexually speaking, in order to obtain that juice and to feed your soul. But if you spill it, if you fornicate, if you reach the orgasm in the sexual act, then from the world of Bria, which is creation, those forces descend into Klipoth, into hell. In Gnosis, we teach that the man has to be created inside of us because the five pointed start is a symbol of the man. So when we have the two hands cross over the sex, we have to pull them toward the heart. That means to transmute the two polarities inside of us into the world of formation. The world of formation is called Yetzirah. How many months takes the woman in order to form the baby in his womb, in her womb? Nine months. Behold here the mystery of the nine heavens of Kabbalah, in which you have to enter into the world of formation by rising the two polarities towards your inside. That is why when you perform the star of five points, you elevate your two hands from your sex to your heart in order to form. That is the meaning of it. Of course, all of those forces descend, as you see, from the world of Bria, creation, into the world of formation. But in the world of formation, there becomes other shells, other coverings from that light. So we will say that the light of Atsilut, which is pure, becoming closet in the world of Bria, in that covering that we are explaining, which is in this, this lady with the seed, with the fruit. And when it enters into the world of formation, it covers more with more shell. And this is how the light descends as it is written in the book of Genesis. And God created the lights, one that reigns in the day and the other in the night, which is the moon and the sun. Those two lights are father and mother. But also in the same verse in the book of Genesis, it is added after that, 
he also created the stars. That means that through the two lights from above, mother and father, emerged the other 12 lights, which are called the 12 zodiacal signs. Because when you see the stars in heaven, the first thing that you would know but when you know Kabbalah is to associate those stars with the zodiacal signs, with the 12 zodiacal constellations. All those stars are the symbol of the unfoldment of that light into many lights. And that is what is called Israel. Is Ra El. The light divided in many fires. Or what the Bible or the Hebrew Kabbalah call Hashim. Many fires, many forces. Particles of the light. Which are closer into the, into the, into the matter. For instance, in the present time, science called that light which is enclosed within the matter in different manners and different levels, vitamins, which is just the solar light in different levels and different forms. But of course, esoterically, we call it the 12 tribes of Israel, or the 12 components of that Ra, of that force that descends into the matter. So, from the world of formation, as you see, that light descends into the world of Asia. Asia is called the world of action, the world of matter, which is represented by the last sephira, Malkut, which is a fallen sephira. Of course, we are, physically speaking, that Malkut Asia of fallen Sephira. Or we will say, in relation with the sacred name of God, Yod Hebav He, we are that He of the holy name, fallen from the holy. And who took that He? out of balance because Yesod and Malkut were one Sephira before. This is how it should be. The matter that emerges from the womb of the mother, which is called Asya, matter in action, should be holy. It is how in ancient times happened. When the children were not created with uh, orgasm, or like the animals, those bodies were immortal. The normal um, uh, span of life of those bodies were 2,000 years. Because they were within another dimension, emerging not for, from orgasm, from the sanctity of a kosher, of knowing how to eat the fruit, how to feed ourselves with that shakti potential of the food. Not only the food that we eat through the mouth, but that we eat also from yesod, which is a sexual act. So, in a moment, you see, as we explain in many lectures, <coughs> In the world of Bria is where Satan appears. That Satan walks through the peel, through the skin of the fruit, through the shell of the fruit, which is called Klipha. It is through that shell that, he, that, that Satan worked. And through that is how he tempted as you remember, Eve, which is directly related with the sexual organs. 
and it worked through the left serpent. Because remember, in the previous lecture we explained that when we talk about the serpent, we have to talk about the three types of serpents. First, the divine serpent Kundalini, which rises in the middle of the spinal column, which is called the Shekinah, the glory of God, the light of God. The light of God is the Shakti potential of the fruit. So when the gods eat from that Shakti potential, they feed themselves with the apples of the garden of Hesperides. The golden apples of that garden. But they know how to eat the Shakti potential. But of course, it is obvious that that humanity, Adam and Eve, didn't know how to eat that Shakti potential. And instead of eating it, they spill it. They spill the seed, the fruit, etc. They ate it like animals. When they did that, they did it through the left serpent, which is called Obd. Many times we uh, explain that this is called the helper, the assistant of Od. Because when you imagine the caduceus of Mercury, you know that in the right is the, the serpent Od, which is solar. In the left is the serpent Obd, which is lunar. This is what Genesis called good Od, evil Od, the two polarities which we have in our bodies, because everybody has those two polarities inside. The two polarities of Bina, the Holy Spirit. So when Adam and Eve fornicated, when they ate from the fruit that was commanded to them not to eat it in the, in the animal way, and they, eat, they did it like that, they did it through the left serpent the serpent of procreation, which is the moon, which is the lunar force, which is related with the sexual organs, which is called Hava, the mother of the living. And of course, this is how uh, Satan acted through them. Because Satan is a force that exists, individually speaking, in every one of us, we will state that there are many Satans in the earth as people in the earth that fornicate. Because the opposite of that is Lucifer, which is not a fornicator. But the fallen Lucifer is Satan. So that Lucifer that was shining, because remember, Lux is light in Latin, and fair is fire, or carrier. The carrier of the light is the fire. So that light was shining inside of us, but when we fornicated, that Lucifer turned into Satan. We, in other words, are the perpetrators of making Lucifer into Satan. Satan suffers inside of us because of our action. Now Satan is black like the carbon inside of us. But before he was a shining Lucifer inside. The light, the primordial light or lux, the first emanation of the unknowable divine. So of course, the light descended and pull down with him the 12 lights of the 12 constellation tribes of Israel inside of us. The Jehu from Asiluth down to the matter, but to a sinful matter called Malkut that the Bible transcribes of Egypt. This is how 
the fall of Lucifer with all of the hosts of angels that were with him. So that Lucifer is his shining aspect, of course. That's why when we talk about Lucifer, we talk about that Chochmah, the sun, which is wisdom, that light. And always we associate it with the zodiac, with the 12 constellations, the stars that the book of Genesis talk about. So when he, Lucifer fell from heaven, from the heaven of Bria, in Atiluth, down to hell, he pulled, he brought down with him the 12 tribes of Israel. All the light of Judah with him into Mizraim, into Egypt, in other words. That is precisely the exile of that light into Malkut. This is the mystery of the myth that we read many times in the Bible about the Jews being exiled in Mizrahim. Physically speaking, as people understand that the race of Israel that now is in the Middle East, at one time they were in Egypt, slaves physically, that never happened. Because the reality, the truth of that myth is that still Israel are or is a slave of Egypt, which is this fallen Sephira. Because Malkut, the physical world in which we live, is a fallen Sephira. And we are a slave of it, of this matter. All of that is that, that light. God, Jehovah, inside of us, our own particular individual God, is concerned with his particulars, particles of light, which are slaves in the matter, in Asia. You understand that? That light is in Asia, is in Malkut, is in the world of matter in action called Mizrahim. Egypt in the Bible. So Moses came in order to teach how to liberate those particles from Egypt through initiation. Moses, a great avatar, a great messenger, like other great messengers of the past. When we read, for instance, the writings in India of Krishna and Rama, or the Brahmans. There are many people in India that are called Brahmans. But they are not real Brahmans in the sense of the myth. When they are liberated. It just represent the people that brought that knowledge at that time through those avatars. So the same thing with Moses. What he wrote, what he dictated, was related, of course, with the Hebrew language. The problem is that in this day and age, the Jews that live in this physical world think that they were slaves in Egypt. They do not understand that they still are slaves of Egypt. We as well, because the Jews or the Yehu represent the light of the world of Atziluth, trapped into the matter. Whether we call it Jehu or Shakti or any other name or another, in another language. So, as we explain in other lectures, we have to create our own particular Moses. Because it represents willpower. This is what Moses represents. Willpower. That willpower is born in Yesod. Grow up, developed, and reaches Tifereth. When it reaches Tifereth, is a no grown, grown, adult Moses. But remember that it is written that Moses 
is a son of the fire and the water. That's Moshe. And that is the world of Yesod. Moses was born in Yesod. Because any creation. Bria. Starts in Yesod. As we explained with the star. There stars. And you go into the world of formation. By pulling that force inside into your heart. Then. Moses appears. Inside of you. But it's a process. Moses itself represents the body of willpower, the causal body. Because the causal body is the only body inside of us capable of going from Tifereth to that, even to Asiluth and beyond, to perform the will of God. That's why Moses represents the will of God. But the Pharaoh represents, of course, Satan. The self-willed that is performing the will through the matter. To the flesh, which is called nefesh. Because there are two types of wills that we perform. Inside of us, we have two wills. The so-called good will, which is related, of course, with the tree of good and evil, the good will. When we know how to eat the fruit in the right way, and how to perform the will of God in the right way. That's called razon, will. Of God. When we do everything under the will of God, under the commands of God, under the law of God, while the other will is the will that we do, related with the shell, related with klipoth. There are many types of klipoth inside of us. In Kabbalah, we said there are three types. Of impure clipoth inside of everybody, which are related to those three demons that we always uh, uh, named in different lectures, or the three traitors of Christ, Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas, really with the three brains. In other words, in other words. The way in which these three clipothic forces inside of us transform the light of Aziluth for the satisfaction of their own desires, which is, in other words, evil will, self willed. Desire is, an, is the opposite of will, good will. So. When we learn how to differentiate the good will from the evil will, then we align to the good will and fight against the evil will. But everything is inside. Through the work that we have to do, we have to create our own particular individual Moses. It's impossible to liberate the particles of light which are trapped in Mizrahim, in Egypt, without the activities of our own particular individual Moses, that in, in many of us is just a seed. But when we enter into the path of priesthood, and we learn the priesthood of Yesod, Hod, and Etzah, which is related with the assimilation of the Shakti potential. That Shakti potential gives birth to Moses inside of us little by little. Remember that physically speaking, we were a simple sperm in the glance of our father. And a simple sperm, we penetrate in the oven of our mother 
and we developed there nine months. And after that nine months, we came out and continued to develop in order to uh, reach adulthood. So, this is a process, natural process of nature in order to grow a physical body. The same thing happened with Moses. As a seed, he exists inside of us, but it depends on us if we want to develop him. And to make it grow inside in the world of formation, reaching the level of master, in order for that Moses or causal body, part of us, to go up and talk with our own particular monad. When that happened, then we see our own being face to face. People think to see God face to face is difficult, of course. If we want to see God face to face with the ego that we have, with all the sins that we have, this is not possible. But if we create our own particular Moses, Moses can do it. That is the causal body. And then you can see your God and talk to him face to face and ask. And then he will command you, do this, do that. You, go, you can go beyond your own inner God and understand that that divinity within you came from the ends of all. Because that Moses is capable of going even to the end so far, and to see his own divinity, that which we call a Elohim, that will enter into him. That a Elohim is the ray of the absolute, that light, the Glorian, that entered into Moses when he was in the burning bush which was precisely the symbol of the tree of good and evil, the fire. His own angel from the world of ends of or commanded him and said, Go down to Mizrahim, Egypt, from where you come from. Because when we want to be born again, as the gospel states, you start from this fallen Sephira, Malkut, Asia. By knowing how to eat, I repeat, how to eat kosher, meaning how to extract the shakti potential of everything that you eat with your mouth, with your thoughts, impressions, and with your sexual act. In order for Moses to be born. And Moses was in Egypt, as you remember. Grow up in Egypt, learn about that, and went up to the superior dimensions, which is the Mount of Sinai, the world of Bria and Atziluth and beyond, and received the commandments. Go down and liberate the other particles that are part of you and part of me, but they are trapped in the matter there in Mizrahim, Egypt. Liberate them. I know, says God there, that you need power. I will, I will be with you. Then Moses says, what should I sh show them to see that I talk to you? He says, what do you have in your hand? A rod, the symbol of the spinal column. Throw it on the ground. And the rod became a serpent. The serpent in the holy ground of God, that, the world of Bria, that serpent was the divine mother. The serpent in fire, or the serpent of bronze, of bronze. That was the power of Moses. He took it by the tail and became the rod again in him. Meaning that that power that he saw there as a serpent was in his spinal column already developed. And he descended. But of course, he was uh, not good for talking. His way of uttering words were not that good. So this says, well, put in front of me somebody that will help me. 
Okay, he says, God, your brother Aaron. And who is the brother Aaron of Moses? Moses is in the middle column of the tree of life. Is that willpower that emerges from Yesod, goes to Tifereth, Da'at, Keter, and beyond? Is the only power that can see God. His brother is Aaron, which is the right serpent. The serpent of the right, which we call Od. Good. Not the left. Because the left is in the hands of the Pharaoh. Pharaoh in the Garden of Eden, as he's explained in many verses of the Bible, that Satan was there in Eden, but fell and brought that light from the left side, orbed, which is the woman, into hell. And there in hell, he transformed through that serpent, which is called Ida in Sanskrit, and that became the Kundavafer organ, the tail of Satan, the power of Satan in hell. The same power, but inverted. A fire, sinful fire. Then, he goes to confront Satan, which is the king of the world. But, Jehovah didn't tell him, go to Satan and insult him, condemn him, tell him that he's a devil and he will go to hell, etc., etc. No, no, no. If you read the Bible, you see how Moses and Aaron come to the Pharaoh respectively. He says, I come to you, I bring the word of God to tell you that God told me to free my people. The particles of light of Yehu, which are trapped in the matter, in Klippoth, which is your kingdom. Because we want to worship God, our God, our individual God. And then the, the Pharaoh, Satan, tells to Moses, and who is Jehovah? I don't know him. Hmm? In other words, this I don't know him means his power is not here. I command this. I am his shadow. But I don't know him here. I know him there. Up there in heaven he has power. But down here in hell I am the boss. And you think that I'm going to do the particles of light just because he says it? Show me. Show me your power. And what Moses did? He commands Aaron, his brother, which represents the serpent Od, to drop the rod on the ground. And the rod of Aaron became a serpent. The good serpent, because it's from the good side, from the right side of the caduceus of Mercury, or the tree of life. And Satan, the Pharaoh, who says, well, what is the big deal? I can do that too. And he dropped the rod, which is representation of the same force, but down. And all the sorcerers which were with him, which follow fornication, orgasm, black tantra, transformed the rods into serpents. The Kundalafer force. The of the fallen serpent. But what happened there? Our own serpent swallowed the serpents of the sorcerers of Egypt. In that way, Moses is showing the Pharaoh Satan that he already has the power of God. And no matter what he will do, he already swallowed his power. Because if the serpent of Aaron is swallowing the serpents of Pharaoh, that means there is more, more power in the right side than in the left side. 
but it's not easy to defeat Satan or the king of this world as you see there. Moses, after that, has to perform the ten plagues. Ten marvels in front of the Pharaoh, in front of Satan, in order to conquer Satan. That's precisely the same myth that we find Mikhail fighting against the dragon. But of course, the book of Exodus describes that fighting in a very detailing way. How Jehovah is telling him, do this. And how after he commands Moses to do that in front of Satan or the Pharaoh. Jehovah comes behind and works through his shadow. And says, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh. And don't let those particles of God to go. So you see that, uh, we will say here, double game. Or double play. While he's commanding Moses, he goes back into the heart of the Pharaoh and says, No, I won't let the people go. So it's the same force. Because what is that force want or wanted? What, what is what the, the, its goal is? It's to make of Moses a great being by developing within himself all of those forces, by absorbing within himself, all that power of light and shadow. Hmm? Because that, that's the goal of creation. To make of us an archangel. An archangel is a being that is beyond good and evil. Hmm? An archangel is not a slave of evil. Control Satan. As Michael, who is like God, is controlling the dragon. But if we cannot control the dragon, we cannot be an archangel. Moses is precisely the living representation of an archangel there. Because after he defeated the Pharaoh, he went, as you know, in the wilderness with all his particles already liberated from the world of Malkut, from the world of Asia. But Lucifer, Satan, is a being that not only has control over Asia. He has control in heaven and in earth. As it is written very clear in the Bible. After he defeated the Pharaoh, he absorbed those forces and went into the wilderness for 40 years. And you know very well, if you read the book of Exodus... That he was fighting against the forces of Lucifer or Satan in the wilderness as well. Through other forces. Which are related with the world of Yetzirah. Because first, the initiate has to triumph in the world of Asia. And that is the ten plagues of the world of Asia. After that. With all that power gained, he has to confront other powers in heaven, which the Master Samael on describes very clear in the three mountains. Other elements that had to be disintegrated until we triumph against the dragon, and finally, God absorbs it completely and makes of that individual a resurrected master, an individual. That had defeated himself, not only in the earth, but also in heaven. Related, of course, with the, his consciousness. What is the first wonder that Moses made in front of the Pharaoh? He says that he commands uh, Aaron to touch the water of the river Nile and convert it into blood. So the Egyptians cannot drink the water. Only the Hebrews drink certain type of water. What is the symbol of that? Aaron is the one that does it. Because Aaron belongs to the right side. The side of good. But touching with the rod, the, the river, means 
the sexual river with the power of God. But what is that power? If you remember, the power of the Father is in the breath. When we breathe Aleph, we purify the blood. That blood goes into the sex. We transmute it. That's the transformation of the water of creation into blood. Into purified blood that will kill the Egyptians. Because the Egyptians or the outcome of Satan feed themselves through the waters of fornication. The lustful waters. Degenerated waters. And Inisha doesn't drink that water. So that's the first miracle that we have to perform too in order to defeat the Pharaoh which is controlling us right now. By doing that, of course, we develop the aura of Shekinah which relates to Keter, the crown. This is how we receive the force when we select and we know how to eat, how to breed, how to transmute the sexual force. And to purify, of course, because while we transmute more the sexual waters of creation in us, the blood becomes enriched with hormones. And those Hashim, forces of the light, that are in the blood, release against the Pharaoh, against the forces that they cannot drink because the lustful egos only drink lust, the waters of fornication. But of course, that is not enough. Jehovah enters into the heart of Satan and says, no, I don't let your particles leave right now because I don't know him. I can do the same thing. He performed the same miracles in the inverse. And then comes and start working in Yesod. Because that first miracle of the blood is in Malkut. Happens in the physical body. But then the next one is in relation with Yesod. In the same physical body, but relation with the sex. To multiply the frog. The frog is an animal that was sacred in ancient Egypt. Of the pharaohs. Because it represents the lunar forces of life. Related with the divine mother. That we ha had to learn how to transmute. The frog represents that hai, that force. Divine force of the divine mother. That had to feed our brain. When that brain is fed by those forces, is when those frogs are released inside of force, which is that plague inside, which acts against the Pharaoh. Because our forces of the Divine Mother that multiply inside and make the life of, of, of particular Satan which is enthroned, of course, there, controlling the forces, miserable. We have to perform that miracle, too, with our own particular Moses, to control the frogs, the lunar forces of Yesod. But then, Jehovah enters again and hardens the heart of the Pharaoh, and don't let the people go. And what happened? Moses performs the miracle of Hod. If you see, for instance, how this works, you see that the triangle of Yetzirah here, Yesod, Hod, and Yetzah, are related with the three brains. Sex, heart, and, and head. So Hod relates to the heart. In Hod, we find those particles of fire called Hashim, which I told you, are the forces in the fruit. Are the forces 
within the matter that we need to liberate. When we do that, then those particles of fire are released and go up, you see, hold through transmutation, through the Eucharist, the real and true Eucharist is liberated and is fed in the heart. It feeds the heart, goes up to the brain. That is what is called lice or the plague of lice because the lice goes and goes into the hair, in your head. Hmm? Simple symbol of that particles of light going into your brain, into your head, and making the life of your intellectual mind miserable. Because then you start receiving knowledge, spiritual knowledge, hidden with the dust particles, where it doesn't go along with your intellect. Things that you don't understand, but you intuit with your heart, that is good. That is the lies. The third uh, uh, plague that is released by Aaron in Moses. But then the Pharaoh is still hardened in the heart because Moses had to perform now the miracle of Netzach. And Netzach is in the head. You see, in Hebrew, with M, Metzach means forehead. And it's related to Netzach, victory. It's in relation with the mind. And here is where Moses performs the miracle of the swarm of flies there. there could be any swarm of any, any insect. But let us say flies. The flies that symbolizes the hypocrites. Flies, of course, that go up against those individuals that proclaim themselves to be apostles, that proclaim themselves to be initiates, but they enter into confusion. Because to, you see, if a swarm of bees or flies are free there in this very moment here in us, it will attack our head, right? Our forehead will go there. And we'll, we'll, we, will, we will be, as I said, bagged by those insects, right? In the same way, we will say that our wisdom, the knowledge of that, annoyed those individuals that are hypocrite scribes and Pharisees that sit on the seat of Moses, the pineal gland, the mind, and proclaimed to be real apostles, but they are not. Because they, are, they don't know how to control the mind. To control the mind is to control the flies. A swarm of forces of the mind. Here we are given this knowledge, and like flies goes into the mind of many people that bothers them. And that's the other the other plague that of course bothers the mind of our own particular individual Satan and the other Satans of other people. But that is a perf that is a, a working that the initiate is doing in himself. But still the Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And then Moses entered into the world of, of uh, mor morality. Or the world we will say of ethics. That begins with Tifereth. Again, if you see this triangle, Tifereth, Geburah, Hesed, you always place it. From below, sex, heart, and mind. Hesed is in the sex. Gebura is in the heart. Hesed is in the head. The next plague is uh, pestilence. Tifereth, 
where we find the holy name of God, which is the willpower, because here is Moses. Tifereth is Moses himself. It's in the center. I said, uh, the Bible says this in relation with that uh, plague. Of pestilence. Behold, the hand of Jod Chava is upon the cattle which is in the field, Shada or Shaddai, Yesod, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep, there shall be a very grievous pestilence. How do you interpret that? Physically, of course, it's easy to see. But psychologically, in the way that we are explaining here, means the hand means Yad in Hebrew. When you say the hand of Jehovah, that means the phallus, the sexual virility, sexual power of Tifereth, which is here, and the willpower, which is the good willpower of God, against all the forces of Shada. Shada is Yesod. All the seed that is devolving, all that seed which is animal, which like the orgasm, will be destroyed inside of you. That is what you command, Satan. The horses, the asses, the sheep, the camels, the cattle. Because all of them fornicate even in the good way. But, of course, the power of God invert that. And it says, now the light has to go up. And we will extract that power from those animals, forces that you command. And they will die. Because without the forces of God, no animal can live within you. This is how the animal sexual power in sex is starting to die within the initiate, within you, by that control. Remember that the hand of Jehovah, what it says there, is the phallus of God, or the willpower of God, the virility in other words. But even when the initiative is at that level and gaining power over his own particular Satan, and Satan has no power already over the animal forces of Shada or demonic forces of Yesod or the sexual power, still he says, I won't let your people go. Because there still are other forces that Moses needs to conquer and God wants him to conquer it. This is precisely the struggle of the initiate in the path. When he disintegrates an ego and he still finds another ego. And disintegrates that ego and finds another one. He says, when I'm going to find this battle against Satan? He has like legions, right? <coughs> and my consciousness is trapping it. So then Moses says, well, I will act now with Geburah. And he take the dust of the earth, throw it into the space of, of, better say, the ashes of certain places, and goes, in, and goes into the flesh of the Egyptians, like boils, ulcers. Geburah is the law, you see? And if you place that Geburah in your heart, you see how the sun, the solar force, acting through the law. This is a way in which the initiate suffers very painful situations because of his karma. There are certain elements within us that need to suffer. You see, when you have boils in your flesh, you suffer. That is physical suffering because of your mistakes. Anger, for instance, that is in the hands of Satan. When you try to control it, 
goes out and destroys your liver and have ulcers. Even physically, you can prove that. That fire of anger really destroys your, your inner organs and even flesh. This is the type of karma in this day and age people are suffering because they don't know how to control Satan and the legions of Satan. So then, of course, by controlling Gebura, we, we control the forces of Satan and of Hod, <coughs> which are the fire. So then, still, uh, by suffering karmic consequences physically on the path of the Bodhisattva, Satan says, continue suffering, I don't let your people go. And then you, you want to continue liberating your essence and you discover then that you have to suffer in Hesed. In Hesed you find the plague of uh, hail mingled with fire. Ming, means Hesed mingled with Gebura, the same karmic force. Water is Hesed. Let it with moral or emotional elements that we have karmically related with fire in Gebura. Will you, will you suffer physically in your, or in your liver because of your anger? Now, you have to suffer emotionally in your heart. See? Because of your head. Because he said is here in the head and the cerebral and spinal nervous system. So that hail and fire in combination is physical and emotional karmic pain due to the transgression of the law in this life and past lives. By under uh, going that type of suffering voluntarily and because you are fighting against the Pharaoh by your own will because you are following the will of God still the Pharaoh is unbreakable will he says okay we reach Hesed but still we have all the three Sephiroth above I don't let the people go you see and then the fighting against Satan continues. What is the next plague? Locusts. That are released with the power of God. The locust. In relation with that, we will say that Moses did this. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit. And the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass on the earth of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads which are, of course, the servants of Satan, or the Egyptians, or the Pharaoh, in, in that myth. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Karma. This is in relation with Gebura. Of course, Bina is releasing this, the, the locusts that will hurt the karma gained in Gebura by Satan by breaking the law. And their torment was as a torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto the battle, and to their heads were as it were crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, breast, breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, 
And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. You see, that is, that's the number of Geburah. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is in Hebrew tongue, Abaddon, but is in Greek tongue, had his name Apollyon, destroyer. Well, those locusts are released inside of you and outside of you. Of course, it relates, as you know, with the knowledge that we are given, the doctrine that we are given, and the knowledge that is multiplied inside of you in order to destroy all the vegetation, all that which is related with your own particular Satan, until all of those Hashim, or Shakti potential, or the powers related with your ego, even with your personality, is taken out by those uh, swarm of locusts and develop inside of you understanding comprehension a type of understanding and comprehension that will allow you to understand what is written and other things that you receive inside because many people read these passages of the bible and think that literally there were locusts in Egypt, as they think, of course, of course, in this day and age, they think that those locusts are helicopters that are similar to, to those locusts, right? But this is a knowledge that was delivered, delivered through that myth for the initiates in order to know what is what they have to face if they take the direct path. And then, Pharaoh says, no, I don't let your people go. And then enters again Jehovah and says, okay, I will darken your knowledge, your wisdom. You will be ignorant. And it was darkened in Egypt. Or as in the Bible, the gospel says, and from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was Darkness on the earth. Egyptian darkness. It's a mystery. Matthew Samael on the or states about the Egyptian darkness. Egyptian darkness is an allegorical archaic phrase. The Egyptians, when they covered themselves with their mantle and closed their eyes to the physical world, remain in darkness. To the world, but in the splendors of the light of the spirit. So that is the Egyptian darkness. When physically, as we are now in physical darkness, Egyptian darkness, we don't see anything. We want to comprehend anything. But when we cannot understand what is outside and you close your eyes in meditation, then the light of the Spirit shines in you. And you see the light, the truth, hidden within those particles of chokmah. Because that's the miracle related with chokmah, darkness. Remember that we talk about darkness in relation with the light. It is stated that Chokmah is darkness. Or as the Egyptian says, Osiris is a dark god. Incomprehensible for those that do not know the path. But to those that open the internal sight, they see the light of the three particles of the Atziluth and beyond, which is the Insof Or. And see that light while the eyes are closed. But when the ordinary people do that, they close their eyes, they only see darkness as well. Because if your eye is in dark, how 
much is going to be that darkness inside of you. Now, when you reach that level, physically speaking, your sight is opened in your physical body. Satan is only one step in order to be destroyed. Because Satan comes to Moses and says, Moses, don't come to my face again. You are winning all of these battles, but the next time that you see with me, I will kill you. you well, you know the story. That he says, well, if you don't let, me, let my people go, God says, I will kill the firstborn. If you read this literally, well, well, who is the firstborn? Well, the firstborn, as we see, is Keter. We're reaching the last of the wonders. Keter is the first emanation. The firstborn, which expresses us to Chokhmah, which is the first in the book of Genesis that says Bereshith. Bereshith Chokhmah, the wisdom, the beginning of wisdom, says in Psalms. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of Jod He Bav He. The name of Jod He Bav He appears in Chokhmah. So the beginning of wisdom is to fear the first begotten of Keter, which is that wisdom, which is Lucifer, the light of Hebab He. But who is the one that is the firstborn of the Pharaoh? Who is Satan? You remember who is the firstborn? Cain, the mind. The firstborn of the maid servant of the Pharaoh. And who is the maid servant of the Pharaoh? Obd, the left serpent that allowed him to fornicate. Right? That's evil will. And who is the first ser servant of the cattle? Because this is uh, the first children, this is, and the cattle. Related with the forces of Shaddai in sex. The three brains are named there. The Pharaoh, the firstborn here in the head, and then the, the, the maid, which is in the heart, which is a weak son, and uh, in the sex, which Christianity called Judas, sex, Caiaphas, heart, and Pilate. Those have to be destroyed. Now the firstborn or the three impure clipothic forces that anybody has inside. Because we have inside the three clipothic forces or the three lunar forces of the protoplasmic bodies that we carry inside that we bring from the animal kingdom. In the animal kingdom, these three particles were fornicating. Now, in this level in which we are, fornication comes or falls into the shame of Satan, which is the shadow of God. But when we come to this moment in the end of Asia, Mizrahim, Egypt, and to go out in the Exodus, we have to defeat those three firstborn particles of Satan inside of us. Had to be disintegrated. They cannot be purified. You have to disintegrate them. Then, when this is disintegrated, in the end, all the particles of fire, Hashim, the EUD, the call of the Jews, those fires inside of us, unite with Moses. And Moses becomes Moses Salaot. The army of Moses. As Moses about leaves Egypt in order to confront other dangers. Because that Moses has to triumph and go to the Mount of Sinai and descend with the horns of Lucifer. Shining in his forehead. A sign that he triumphed over the dragon. But in order to do that, he has to travel with all those particles. And be careful because still they are related with other forces. 
they no longer belonged to the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh was defeated very powerfully. We will say, now the Pharaoh is or was absorbed by Moses. And Moses is a kind of Pharaoh and Moses together going further in order to triumph and become one with the forces of Lucifer. Do you have questions? Would you say that the story of Moses going to the Pharaoh is similar to the story of the Israel ascending into the abyss to appeal to Pluto to defeat Persephone or Rodice or the story of Moses uh, uh, related, you said, with uh, other myths, like in the Greco Roman myths, takes about uh, descending of, into the world of Pluto in order to liberate Eurydice or Persephone. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same way because first, the initial has to conquer hell in the world of Asia. To do that is a great task. And for that, of course, you have to enter into the initiation. Because this is how the Bible describes all the ten wonders of Moses in front of Satan. That in this case is very hidden and put it Pharaoh. Now listen. I'm not saying that all the Pharaohs of Egypt, of the civilization of Egypt, were Satan. No. We were saying that all of them were having the power of Asia because they conquered their own particular individual Satan as Moses did. I said Moses absorbed his own Pharaoh and became of course a Pharaoh Moses, a king of Egypt. Because to defeat the king of Egypt is to become over the king of Egypt, meaning dominating nature by will. So this is precisely the mystery of Moses. All the pharaohs that were before him were, of course, kings that were fighting against the dragon. And that is why they became pharaohs. But in his own doctrine, since he emerged from the decadence of Egypt into Jerusalem, he was also fighting against the negative forces that was already, they were already degenerated in his time that were represented by the Pharaoh. As we will say now, for instance, in our times, the president represents the head of the negative forces that all of us are entangled, which are degenerated. So to defeat ourselves, we will say, symbolically, we will write, well, in my time, I defeated the president of the United States if I triumph. Hmm? But it doesn't mean that I was fighting against him. It means that I'm fighting him that represents in my case, because I live in these times, not in the time of Egypt, not in the time of Moses, by the president. Or if I live in England, I say against the queen. Right? This is how you have to understand and comprehend all the books. Because Mohammed as well wrote in his time about many things that still people do not understand. Yeah? Is this lecture the representation of the first initiation of major mysteries? We will say it's just part of it. Is uh, uh, because in order to to do what we explain here, Moses has to be born inside, and Moses is born in the fifth initiation of major mysteries. So before Moses reaching adulthood, we had to work in the fourth initiation, in the third, and the second. And this is the, uh, no, this is not the first. This is just the first uh, work that the initiate has to perform against Satan with his own Moses. But the first incision of major mysteries is the beginning of the elaboration of willpower, which is represented in the Bible by Isaac. So Isaac has to be born in us. Jacob has to be born in us. 
Joseph has to be born as then Moses. This is a process. Of course, as I said, Moses is the outcome of all the other forces. So when you see Moses there, within him is Jacob. Within him is Joseph. Because it is written that when Moses left Egypt, he took the bones of Joseph with him. It is not that he dig and took the bones in a, in a coffin, you know, with him. No, it means that all those values of Joseph were inside of him developed already. And because he developed the values of Jacob as well within him, and because he developed the values of Isaac and Abraham within him. So all of them were within him. So Moses is the final outcome, or we'll say, of Genesis in order to perform what we explain today. Yes? By initiating your path. And how do we start initiation? Or how do we come and initiate is the question. We become an initiate by initiating, by starting, in other words. Initiation means to initiate, to start. How do we start? We start by uh, eating kosher, Kabbalistically speaking, meaning Everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that you feel, had to be with God. But the main thing that you have to do with God is the sexual act. In a moment when you are in the sexual act, you have to feel with God. And to transmute, to eat like God, the fruit of the tree of good and evil. To eat it in the good way, not like in a satanic way. Because that's the way of the animals. That's the way that everybody is it. That's initiation. That's the beginning. Because every initiation begins in Yesod. The ninth sphere, says the Matthew Samael, is where everybody is tested. Is where we find the door of initiation. When we learn how to eat from the tree of good and evil in the right way. And we liberate the particles of God within. And the path starts. Of course, we had to learn also how to liberate those forces in the heart. By controlling our negative emotions. And we have to learn also through meditation. How to liberate those parts. Which are trapped in all those egos that we have within. Which is the world of clear path. That's initiation. The three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. To stop being an animal in different degrees. And becoming a human in different degrees. Until we reach that Adam into the image of God. That is represented in Moses, of course. With the powers of her nature. Do you have another question? Yeah, the question is the invocation of the wise man Solomon that we said, powers of the kingdom be ye in, uh, under my left foot and in my right hand. Of course, the powers of the kingdom are the kingdom of Makut. Under my left foot, you see the left is the left side through which we fell. To be the powers of the kingdom of, under my left foot means to control them. Hmm? And in my right hand, which is the right or the two polarities of good and evil. Hmm? This is precisely what uh, in the invocation of Solomon you said in the beginning. Powers of the kingdom, be ye under my left foot and in my right hand. Hmm? That is the controlling of those forces. But we are fornicators. Those powers of the kingdom are not on their, our left foot, but on, on top of our head. Right. We have to transmute it in order to control them, you know, all, all the negative forces of the path. And the right hand, of course, is God Himself. It's the right. 
and Satan is the left. You want to conquer Satan, your left side, do it with your right. But you have to know how. Here is what you learn. Question? Someone commented that you are an initiate and you are serious about pursuing God. Is this true? You are an initiate, it says, when you are pursuing God. Uh, <coughs> well, to be an initiate really is to begin in the Asad. That's the truth. To have uh, the journey for following God is good, but not enough. Because there are many people in this world that are good people, but uh, that good elements are related with klipoth. Mm -hmm. The way in which their Satan is good. You know, there are many Satan inside of us which are good, but not in the good side of God. To do good in the sight of God is to accomplish his commandments. To start by not eating the fruit in the wrong way. That's the beginning. Because the beginning of the fall into following Satan was the orgasm. That was the beginning when we started following Satan. And we fell into Mizrahim, Egypt. And if we continue spilling the seed, eating the fruit... In the way that Satan teaches to the animals, we are not initiates of God, but following the left path of Satan. In order to follow God, we have to go on to the right. And this is how to learn, how to transmute your sexual force. That's the beginning. In order for those hopes or longings that are in the heart to become concrete, not just good intentions. Another question? So how would you properly define an initiate? Like someone is actually an initiate. What does that mean? Not just being doing transmutation. There's many people who are trying transmutation classes but just doesn't make them an initiate. So how do you define it? How do we define what an initiate is? Well, somebody that initiates the path. The path, the thing is, what is an initiate in itself, right? Somebody that worked with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. To work with your transmutation, the annihilation of your ego, and uh, performing good for humanity in different levels. That is a white initiation. Because we find also black initi initiates that start doing the contrary in the, in the left side. And they also start their awakening in evil and for evil. So there are two types of initiates, the white and the black, the one in the light and the, uh, and the one in the darkness, the one following God and the other following the shadow. It depends. The good will and the evil will. We are in the middle. We have the freedom to choose Going up or going down. We are in Asia, in Malkut, in the physical body. The doctrine is, is given to you. You go to go up or to go down. Remember that up is a tree of life. Down is a shadow of the tree of life called Klipoth. Both sides are inside of us. Another question? Yeah, someone asked, in the lecture about the dissolution of the eye, someone else recalled the story of discovering the ego of double seen and working on it day and night. What would working on the ego day and night imply for this initiate who develops? What does that mean? What does to work in an ego day and night means? The question is, how do we, uh, how do we uh, disintegrate an ego, for instance, of self-esteem that uh, uh, is bothering us? As in this case of the Master Samael, I was working that ego, and he continued working day and night in that ego until he disintegrated the ego. 
we have to understand that uh, certain egos are related with certain forces of karma, certain elements that we have, especially self-esteem in the heart. And uh, they cannot be disintegrated until you suffer the consequences that you originated in past events, in past lives. Those precisely are related with self-esteem in which you want to be loved, but there is no love there. Instead, there is hatred against you. And uh, that is in relation with the boils or the ulcers that are released when the ashes are thrown into the air. You have to suffer the consequences of certain elements in you. The particles of God within you don't suffer that because they are free, they are pure. But the elements that you have that are trapped in that, which are within you, suffer. And you suffer because of that. So that, of course, in relation with self-esteem, is related with it. Because many of, those, many of us uh, uh, suffer because self-esteem. Self-esteem, we will say, is the root of many egos. The root of anger, root of hatred, the root of lust, root of many egos that we have within that are entangled in it. And in order to disintegrate that type of ego, you have to comprehend and to understand how that ego is related with all other psychological aggregates. You cannot discover that if it's not with the relationship with people, with your family, with your friends. And you are attentive and observing yourself you see how those psychological aggregates related with that ego that you want to annihilate are related with. And for that you need to be attentive day and night. Not only in this physical plane, but with internal planes. Night implies going out of your body and even studying your dreams or the event that happened there until you finally annihilate that ego but because you annihilated other elements that are related with it. When you are comprehending an ego, do not uh, be confused because that ego could be related with other egos, with other aggregates. Remember that if somebody insults you, you feel hurt. And if you react with anger, that's an anger rooted in your self-esteem. But if you don't do it, and you retain that, and you remember you insulted me a month ago, and I cannot forgive you. That is resentment, rooted in the self, self-esteem. After all the good that I did, he did that to me, you see. To go there, to inquire, to comprehend, implies a lot of meditation and observation in our daily life if that is already annihilated or still is alive. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.